Welcome to Fire University. This is a podcast dedicated to fire ecology and management within the Natural Resource University podcast network. My name is Dr. Marcus Lashley. I'm a wildlife biologist, an assistant professor of disturbance ecology at the University of Florida, and a lifelong hunter that's passionate about wildlife conservation and management. In this podcast, I will interview scientists and professionals, not only on the latest research in fire ecology, but also about their experiences in hopes that you as the listeners can learn why fire ecology is important and also how you can use it to meet your natural resource management goals. So let's get to the burning questions in Fire University. Hey everybody, welcome back to Fire University. I have again with me John Grucci. We went to graduate school together and worked with Craig Harper and, and uh, he's one of those people that, that uh, thinks about field management quite a bit and uh, this is something that I think is important for us to cover during this time when we have a lot of uh, turkeys with poults on the ground and uh, we have a lot of, of nesting quail, I guess, as well. So, John, I appreciate you coming on the show again. Uh, really good good to hear from you and, and talk to you. Yeah, man, I appreciate it, Marcus. Good deal. Yeah, I actually uh, did a uh, whistle count this morning for Bob White's. I only heard uh, one bird, a little depressing, but uh, the, uh, I texted with some other folks in the state, and they heard had had a pretty good morning. I uh, heard a yeah. few whistles. So Good. Well, I, I guess the reason I wanted you to come on here, I know that uh, especially in your graduate studies and a lot of your career, you've done a lot with with uh, field management and restoration of, of prairie and those types of things. And I, I think it's a good topic and timely topic for us to talk about what does what, what are we looking for in terms of the structure of a plant com- community in old field to benefit a hen with poults or you know for quail use what what are you thinking about what does that look like sure that's a that's a good question and i mean uh you know you can you can go to the literature i'd say uh bob white brood rearing and nesting cover has been described very well in the literature um now i will say that brood rearing uh you know quantifying um a bob white brood are actually tracking them is really difficult right because they're little and we're just now getting the ter- the technology to be able to track individual broods and be able to track the actual chicks up until now mostly what we're doing is tracking the the hens you know this and so mm-hmm. uh you know there there is a little bit of discrepancy there maybe some people could argue balls and strikes on some different things uh about exactly what those broods are doing but in general uh, and, you know, you and I talked about this beforehand, Bob Whites are pretty good, pretty strong selectors. And so um, in most of the studies that we look at, uh, we can really well define pretty much Bob White nesting and brew rearing cover. And they're two different cover types. So Bob White uh, brew rearing cover, one of the key factors we're going to look for is bare ground. And if you look at a lot of these studies, they quantify bare ground a little bit differently. Um, but, but essentially we want openness at ground level. We want small chicks, especially those first two weeks, those little chicks are going to be big as about as big as your thumbnail, uh, right when they hatch out. And then they're going to, uh, piddle around and get maybe as big as your whole thumb, you know, after, after that, uh, first two or three weeks. And, uh, we've got to be able to get those little chicks moving around, uh, and be able to forage because what they really need are invertebrates and about 80% of their diet that first two weeks is going to be bugs and they're trying to build feathers and they need protein, all that. And so we got to be able to get them, uh, get them that stuff. Uh, and they've got to be able to access invertebrates. Mm-hmm. And I know you've done, uh, a lot of research on the, the bug communities and stuff like that. You and I both have, have talked extensively about that. Uh, there's some mm-hmm. interesting things going on there that we could talk about later. Uh, sure. Well, before we uh, go any further, when when you're saying bare ground, I just want to clarify what you mean. You you don't mean like it's all open dirt, sure. right? Like where like if you dissed a field, that would be bare ground. But that's not really that's right. what you're talking about, is it? N- no. Yeah. So uh, that's actually a, a good question. If we, uh, it's kind of confusing in the literature because if you read the studies from Kansas and Texas they probably are talking about dirt. (laughs) You know, they'll say uh, a plant community is 20 or 30% bare ground. 
And of course they get mm-hmm. like 14 inches of rain a year. So they probably are, that's probably true. But in, uh, in, <laughs> in Florida, there's no such thing as a plant community with really any bare ground. Right. I mean, if you, mm-hmm. if you, if you just add water and you get, you guys have what, like a 360 day growing season. And so, uh, you've, uh, you're not going to have, uh, just actual bare dirt for very long in most of the Southeast. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about, I guess, is uh, bare ground at that bottom foot uh, of vegetation there. So if you were to look at a plant community straight down and you're standing up, it's going to be green. But when you just part that initial canopy of vegetation, you're looking at the the actual soil, you should be able to see some soil. And so Mm -hmm. the the opposite of bare ground, if you want to think about what, what bare ground is, it may be better to think about what it's not. It's not litter. It's not thatch. It's not deep pine straw. It's not deep, thick grass. So Mm -hmm. um, we want to have some bare ground when we're talking about brew rearing. And usually that's going to be a cover type that's one to two growing seasons following some type of disturbance, fire or Mm -hmm. whiskey. Okay. So really, if we were thinking about it at the at the human scale, it would be like walking into a forest and you have a canopy of trees over you, but you don't have much in the understory or mid story that's blocking you from walking around under it yeah it's like walking into the the the, the, some the you know so-called park-like uh forest you know we're walking in walk easily and move around same same uh principle i guess for the bob whites we even called it umbrella cover so if you think about the structure of an Mm -hmm. umbrella you know you've got a canopy above and then a central stem so yeah so that's okay. So basically these little bumblebees, that's what I guess uh, a lot of people will call the little chicks when they're yeah, small yeah, like yeah. that. Uh, they need to be able to walk around under the canopy of vegetation, which itself may only be a foot tall. That's right. And, and so not only is it important for them to be able to move around easy to get those bugs, but man, they can't thermoregulate really well at that mm-hmm. size. And so it's particularly, you know, the upper critical temperatures, uh, I mean, or, 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 you know, especially if you're talking about these second broods, you know, we get into July, mm-hmm. they've got to be able to have shade or they're just going to cook. So yeah. they've got to be able to, and, and also ventilation, you know, under that, that mm-hmm. cover type. So uh, not just, so most of your vegetation that's going to do that is going to be forbs, you know, broadleaf herbaceous plants. I've just, the umbrella kind of describes mm-hmm. the structure of a forb. But then also woody cover is pretty important. So, and when I say woody cover, I'm mainly talking about shrubs, low growing shrubs like briars or sumac mm-hmm. or plum thickets, those kinds of things. Um, they're really good for, you know, some kind of vertical structure to be able to hide, uh, mm-hmm. to be able to hide those, those critters from predators. I got you. So, um, what, when you're saying forbs in an old field scenario, are there some particular forbs that you're looking for in that community? Um, you know, it kind of depends on the soil type and kind of where you are. Uh, in, I'm in Mississippi, of course, so where, where you are in the state is going to be, you know, maybe the dominant forb community. In most of our upper coastal plain, we like, you know, ragweed, common ragweed is very good. Um, Mm -hmm. In some of the state, you know, goldenrod, which is a perennial, uh, most of these are going to be annual plants, but of course, goldenrod is a perennial. It's, it's not bad. You know, some of it I've seen it dominant in cases. Uh, We'll Mm -hmm. also see uh, Biden's or beggar ticks, which is an annual, um, you know, some, some different plants um, that that would be common. When we get further south, we'll actually see, you know, a lot more uh, when we get into the coastal, lower coastal plain. We get a lot more of the legumes, uh, your sensitive briar, your desmodiums and lispidesis and all that. Of course, we have those in the upper coastal plain as well. So, mm-hmm. but, it, but it could be any variety of plants. Um, I'll be honest with you, you know, there, there's two kinds of things we're talking about here, composition and structure. Yeah. And just from what you, what, you know, when we talk about animal use, mm-hmm. I think there's some, sometimes when they certainly key in on composition, um, you know, if you look at white-tailed deer they're going to key in on those oak mots whenever they're dropping uh acorns and things like that right but Mm -hmm. for brood rearing i'm going to say they're keying in on structure so i've seen broods in thistle patches you know what i mean you and Mm -hmm. i were just talking about nesting cover we've seen them you know as much as we hate non-native grasses i've seen bob white's nest in non-native grass it's been reported in literature i mean it can be done it's not so much a composition thing for some some uh, aspects of the animal's life history it's more of a right. structure thing well i think uh 
that's a, a good point. We, we both have seen that and particularly at nesting, the nesting stage for quail, they seem to be able to, to tolerate some of these less desirable conditions. Sure. But, uh, one of the, the anecdotes that we just talked about a few minutes ago before we got on is when they do nest there, it's actually once they've hatched is the, the big problem, right? They've got to get their chicks somewhere else where they have that structure so they can thermoregulate and find insects and avoid predators and all that. Yeah. And uh, that's where the, the non-native grass in particular becomes a big problem it's going to fail yeah so um you know nesting cover we described brewery nesting cover is actually quite a bit different right so basically nesting cover is going to be senescent grass you're going to have to either have some type of substrate right either senescent mm -hmm. grass or pine needles you know clearly in, in most of our pine forests in the south they're going to be abundant and that's a commonly used nesting substrate i've seen them use uh leftover forb stems like if you know how giant ragweed and things like that have the residual stem from the previous year, they'll make nests out of that. They can use a lot of different things, but they're basically going to need, uh, you know, some type of dead plant material to be able to mm -hmm. make the nest. So that's a good, that's their nesting substrate. They also are going to need some type of vertical structure to hide the nest. Most people are familiar with quail nests. They look like a little igloo and they're going to select <laughs> areas that kind of cover the, that opening uh, where that opening is covered and not, uh, uh, not open to, to potentially be predated. Yeah, that makes sense. So, uh, do you want to talk a little contrast, I guess, that to turkeys before we get into how you create the, you know, these things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we can. Uh, the turkey side of things is a little, you know, you and I, you and I kind of talked about it beforehand. I I used to pride myself and you know thinking I was an upland game bird biologist, and then we started putting GPS collars on turkeys, and they pretty much took me to school. Um, <laughs> but in, in, in any case, uh, what we were just, you know, what we just talked about Bob whites is pretty straightforward. The literature has kind of got Bob whites licked. Uh, they're strong selectors, we might say. And so that nesting cover is going to look generally the same. Even, uh, I would even say you could go from Florida to Oklahoma to, to South Texas, and it's going to be pretty much pretty similar nesting and brooding yeah. for Bob whites. It's going to be totally so the composition. Might yeah, yeah, composition is going to be totally different, but the structure is going to be fairly similar. Yeah. Wild turkeys, that's not so, man. They're, uh, they're what we, what we would call, particularly for nesting, they're kind of weak selectors. And so they're going to nest in a variety of substrates. And we've all found the turkey nest in the middle of this senescent wheat field, you know, last year's wheat or mm -hmm. whatever, seen turkeys nest in places where we thought that, what's she thinking? You know, that's not got a mm -hmm. chance uh, of, of making a successful nest. So, and, and it's not uh, anything, you know, with the wild turkey in general. Uh, it's just they tend to be weak selectors. They're probably operating at scales, uh, a little bit broader spatial scales than we're used to working with. But mm -hmm. in general, turkey nesting cover is going to be a little more rough than bobwhite nesting cover. So bobwhite nesting cover is going to be that two to maybe three years after disturbance. Turkey mm -hmm. nesting cover is probably going to be more like, depending on your, your precipitation regime, probably going to be more like three or four years after disturbance when we start to really see the that dense vegetation to hide a turkey nest. You think about it, mm -hmm. a turkey's a little bigger animal. Uh, it's got a little more to hide, and it's, their nests are not very well constructed. They're kind of out, you know, pretty vulnerable to being, uh, to being seen. So they need a little bit more dense structure. But now that being said, I've totally seen turkeys nest in – in a fallen tree top in the middle of a broad open forest, you know, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit more variable. Yeah. Well, and I, I guess one of the points to make about that is the context matters a lot that the yeah. turkey is in. And, uh, you know, if they're, they're relatively weak selectors, like you're saying, if they don't have many places to select from that are that's right. that we would view as high quality they might end up in somewhere that's a little bit lower quality that doesn't necessarily mean what they selected is high quality i guess that that's right that's right so you know if you know you hate to get to take home messages in the first five minutes here but that you know the take home is diversity right the more we can distribute mm -hmm. quality nesting cover throughout the landscape, the more likely the weak selector is to plop down in a, in a, in a patch that's going to give them higher success. Right. So if you look at, uh, you know, nesting is just tough turkey nesting in the literature, but in general, it's, you know, kind of, as we've described it, 
Brood rearing covers a little more, uh, a little more sensitive. In other words, um, it's going to be more similar to the Bob White uh, brood rearing cover. And actually, you do see some selection. I guess we were just talking about a. There was a paper in 2020 that kind of looked across a bunch of different GPS collar studies, and basically mm -hmm. found that uh, broods, hens with broods, were selecting open areas or areas with more open cover types. And then mm -hmm. it also found that their survival probability decreased with in, with increasing distance moved in the first three days. So what that means is that hen, after she hatches, within that first three days, if she's got to go a far distance to find what she's looking for, that brood rearing cover where she needs to be able to forage those chicks, and they're going to spend 80% of their day foraging. They're just eating and eating and eating because they got to grow rapidly. Mm -hmm. If she's got to take them a long distance to find that food resource and to find that cover, it's going to have a lower probability of that brood being successful. So we've got a little mm -hmm. bit more to say about brood rearing cover in turkeys. And like you and I talked about, um, if you really kind of get an eye for it, you start looking across the landscape, it's pretty evident that brood rearing cover is is probably, in, in some cases, probably the, the limiting factor on some landscapes. Um, yeah, especially it seems like in the south where, you know, turkeys, we're, we're worried about their populations. Sure. I know that I, I drive around, you know, across the the South all the time, several states, and it's pretty rare that I see some, a field that I think, man, that's really good brood reeling cover for, for yeah. turkeys. You know, where, where do you end up seeing the broods most of the time on the road right away? You know what I mean? Yeah. They're going to they're mm -hmm. be in the edge of the road ditch or, you know, kind yeah, of. I saw one just the other day and with the brood right on the edge of, of yeah. the, uh, 75. But but then you look around and you go, well, where else, where else were they going to rear that brood? Yeah. You know, I mean, there's not, there's not a whole lot of options. So, um, you know, that's, that's one thing to pay attention to. And again, if they're going to be drawn to open areas, you know, again, they can't roost in trees, uh, at that young age, they don't, mm -hmm. they're not flyers yet. So bef until they can roost, uh, up off the ground, uh, having some, some field cover or some open areas that is, that are being managed as high quality brewery and cover, it's probably going to be beneficial to folks who are interested in, um, having, uh, dense turkey and, and quail populations. Mm-hmm. So let's uh, kind of circle back to what you were just talking about with the study. And I, well, to preface that, I think the data on turkeys show a similar pattern to what, what you're talking about and what we've just said. When you look at, at nesting, it, it's not as good as we'd want it to be. But if you just kind of look at broadly at nesting success, it, it's poor to moderate generally across studies sure but if you look at brood rearing that's generally pretty bad yeah so it seems like to me uh that that might be linked to what we're describing where the birds need to get to high quality brooding cover and then you mentioned that study about moving far yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that being a really bad thing so i wanted to lead you know, kind of preface all the way up to this lead in to ask you, well, what does, does it matter what kind of opening it is that like, is it okay for it to be a Bahia pasture or a, you know, a yeah. pesky pasture or whatever, or does it need to be similar to what you were describing earlier uh, for quail? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think again, that kind of depends on the landscape we're in. Right. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I'll cop out behind that, but you know, if you're in uh, South Texas, it's going to be a little different than uh, a lot of other places. And I would preface by saying that it, that first three days or certainly the first 14 days, it mm -hmm. probably matters, probably, probably a pretty big deal. Um, and it's going to be more of that umbrella type cover that we're, we're going to seek out. And then in terms of what type of opening, I don't know that that necessarily matters. We see them using, and I, I know in this study, some other things they're looking at roads, you know, daylighted mm -hmm. roads, the, uh, some of this is on big tracts of public land where they basically would classify it as a closed road, you know, so a low traffic yeah. road. They'll use those. They also use um, pretty commonly will use food plots, supplemental plantings, the edges and all. And most of those are going to be fallowed uh, through the summer. So um, I think it depends on the landscape context, let's say, as to what opening, because I don't mm -hmm. imagine turkeys are going to be utilizing those big soybean fields, you know, where Bob Whites will use the edge of a, a soybean field and even get. 100 yards, 200 yards out into the soybean field with a brood. Mm -hmm. I don't see that happening quite as much with wild turkey. They're going to be more hugging the edges, uh, 
of those of, of the forests and things like that. But mm-hmm. in any case, I, I think it just uh, you it, it depends heavily, but you could broadly say that they're going to be selecting uh, managed openings. It's going to have to have some type of frequent disturbance like mm-hmm. a roadside, you know, like a food plot. Everything that we yeah. talked about is going to be similar in that it's it's a disturbed cover type. So it sounds like to me there are lots of ways that you could get to having the opening, but sure. you're you're still, especially for that first two weeks, you need that structure that you were talking about with the the umbrella structure, so that pul- the little tiny pulps can run around under the canopy of sure of cover. Yeah, I think so, man. And I, like I said, you know, the, what we mainly wanted to talk about today was probably just managing fallow fields. I think uh, what we mm-hmm. see in, in my day job, uh, I'm a private lands biologist, and so I go out and, and, and look at individual landowner properties and make recommendations, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty uncommon to see a, a field that's managed for brood rearing cover. And generally, if you're on a property in the south and they have an opening, probably going to plant it. They're probably going to uh, do some other type of management than just mm-hmm. managing for the purpose of nesting and brood rearing cover. Unless, of course, they're a, a, a you know, high intensity bob white plantations and all that would fall sure. maybe outside of that. But for the most part, you're talking about working forest or working uh, agricultural lands. And so yeah. it's hard so, to find so those are- fallow fields. Yeah, so people are planting crops in it, or they have it planted in a grass that they're haying right. or or grazing right. or something, and or they're planting it in food plots if they're wildlife interests. Yeah, so yeah. you're saying that you don't see this uh, these these old field communities yeah. being managed very often for for wildlife. Yeah, we just we've started calling them just unplanted openings. You know, if you've got an opening. Yeah. In the forest, it's not planted. You know, what are, what are we right. going to do with that and how are we going to manage it? And that, and just to be sp- specific about unplanted, you mean it's not planted in a food plot That's or right. in a pasture grass? An, ag- an agronomic crop. It's not, not yeah. planted in any type of crop. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So would you say, it sounds like you're telling me then in your experience, that's often the problem is that it has uh, some sort of grass in it or a crop in it or what? What are you, when you see fields and you're thinking about trying to get them into a usable community for structure for, for brood rearing? Sure. What, what's normally the problem, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. So, again, it, it just comes down to the fact – a lot of it is varied landowner objectives, but most of the t- – most of the, for the most part, if you ride around most of the southeast – if, if it is a forest landowner, they're probably going to be trying to make, you know, financial – uh, decisions and a lot of the forests they're going to be managing mm-hmm. for uh, pulpwood or, or you know salt timber and pines uh, or they've got hardwoods and they maybe have an aesthetic issue so every time they have any opportunity for an opening the first thing they do is try to plant either some type of food plot or again like I said if we're on a different type of property where they've got an agronomic or an agricultural objective so I would say one of the biggest and, and, and regardless by the way those turkeys are still going to find those openings and they're going to try to brood rear in some of them or nest in some of those openings that maybe aren't in the best uh, mm-hmm. cover types for that those types of activities. So I would say for sure, you know, having some managed openings uh, that are managed for uh, for brood rearing and nesting would be a, a huge thing. And then, of course, if we, we would love to be able to have nesting and brood rearing cover within the forest, within the context of that managed forest. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think that's a, a, you know, a good, another noble goal. And then also having corridors that kind of connect all that stuff. So having the managed roadways and all that kind of stuff, having linear mm-hmm. openings and uh, taking advantage of right of ways, uh, power line right of ways, gas line right of ways. We'll see a lot of nesting and uh, on those, those right of ways. Okay. So could you walk us through uh, if you've got this, this unplanted opening sure. that you're talking about, what, what are you, what's going through your head when you're thinking about managing that in, in the long term? I guess, to keep it in a structure that is maximizing the production yeah. of poults or chicks. So mostly what we're doing is uh, if I go out onto an individual property, one of the first things I want to look at is the soil map. I want to see what, what kind of soils we're dealing with on that property. Mm-hmm. And then I want to think about um, what are the, what's their current land use. So if it's mostly forest, 
and we don't have any openings, I want to start creating openings. That's going to take timber harvest. And so it's a little different situation than, than some of the other things we talked about. But basically, I want to target brood rearing and nesting cover in areas that have the, the worst soil. And that's because if I want to put my agronomic crops in my best soil, right? If I'm going to have mm-hmm. a clover patch or a, a food plot for deer, I want to put that in the best soil. And I want the dry ridges and the deep sands and all that. I'm, that's where I'm going to put brood rearing and nesting cover because it's also easier to maintain. I'm not trying to constantly fight sweet gum and those types of things the aggressive plants coming in. Mm-hmm. So the first thing you want to do is look at the soil map and figure out, do I want to make an opening or do I have an existing opening that I want to change the strategy on? You know, sometimes we've got landowners who are trying to force food plots into junk dirt. We'll say, man, that's a better use for that is to try to go into uh, nesting and brew rearing. So that's mm-hmm. one instance. The other instance is if we're working on maybe a, a little more of a working landscape where they've got cattle or you've got uh, hay, you've got, uh, soybeans row crop that kind of thing and so then you're looking at a little bit different strategy you know what what are some odds and ends maybe what are what's their overall goal if it's still to have cattle you know maybe we need to look into you know how we can balance some of that but if we've got some odds and ends some places we can make brewery and cover one of the first things we're going to have to do is eliminate the pasture grasses from those fields Mm -hmm. and they're almost always in the south almost any field at some point (laughs) has been planted a common bermuda grass or bahia grass or tall fescue, depending on your kind of latitude. So uh, so the first thing we want to do is identify that composition issue, you know, that we might have. We want to try to eliminate it. So those pasture grasses, we, you and I were just kind of joking back and forth at how we've seen turkey nests in those fields. That was probably more of a function of what they had to deal with, right? They didn't have many mm-hmm. other options. But we know for yeah. a fact those pasture grass fields are not good brood rearing cover. In fact, we've got studies they've done the thermal studies and i mean the uh they put the little little copper quail out and then they've also foraged chicks and i mean it takes mm-hmm. them like uh, seriously like 30 minutes on a hot day in the summer to expire in a bermuda grass field that's a fact i mean that's all been yeah. done so um you know we want to try to eliminate that if we can on recreational properties you know if we can entirely on recreational properties but if we've got to have some patches here and there for for hay crops or if it's uh you know a pasture situation we want to try to find odds and ends where we can eliminate uh, pasture grass and then manage the native seed bank. Um, and so we mm-hmm. do that with a combination of fire, burning, maybe herbicides. We're going to have to eliminate those pasture grasses first off with with herbicide. Mm-hmm. And it's also going to take more than just you go out and spray some Roundup over it, right? And oh, it's yeah. It's going to be more intense even. So, so it depends. Almost, almost any of the pasture grasses that we've listed are going to take multiple treatments. Um, and mm-hmm. so you're going to have to prepare that pasture grass for spraying, and you're usually going to do that with, uh, you know, either haying or burning or something to clean off the thatch and kind of get it green and growing. And then mm-hmm. you're going to do your initial herbicide application. You and I were just talking about bahia grass before the, before we got yeah. on here. Bahia is one of those weird ones. It's it's easy to kill. When it's easy to kill, you know, whenever the stuff is green and growing, you've got to make sure it's actively growing. It's got a little tiny blade. Mm-hmm. If it gets any drought at all, it'll curl up and it won't take up chemical. So you make sure your grass is cleaned off pretty. It's got to look like it's ready to be hayed, you know. Just mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the cattle farmer's mouth ought to be watering when he looks at that field. <laughs> and then we want to go in there and spray the heck out of it. So, yeah. so yeah, uh get it. Yeah, and your initial treatment is probably going to be a broad-spectrum herbicide, something like Roundup or Imazapir. Mm-hmm. You're going in to try to knock it in the head as good as you can, and then hopefully you're going to follow up maybe within the same growing season. Sometimes it'll be a growing season later and have to do some type of follow-up application. But you usually have to triage that, right? So after I spray mm-hmm. Bermuda grass, it's going to be probably Johnson grass or something like that coming back, and I have to do do a different chemical. So it just yeah. all depends, man. Okay, and then even after that, you may have patches of it or, or other things trying to invade that you would go back in and spot spray. Yeah, yeah, it's never in a never-ending right? cycle, man. I would say on average it's going to take at least two to three years to get a field kind of right, if you will, uh, mm-hmm. after after you start the process of trying to kill pasture grass. So don't, you know, don't think it's a, you know, one-and-done type process. It, it is a commitment. Um, and right. even, even after that two to three years, you're going to have recurring – Bermuda grass in the fire ant hills and on the roadsides, you know, the little, the any any roads you've got going in and out there, and then of course you're going to have invasive plants like Kogan grass and those types of things that may come in. So you're always going to have to monitor mm-hmm. 
um, that vegetation type. Yeah. So it sounds like learning a, a few key plants is probably important, especially the ones that you don't want around. Yeah. Yeah. You need to learn, learn a few plants or, you know, it's kind of like I talk about having a, a, a boat or a bird dog or anything. I, I don't want to have a boat or a bird dog, but I want to have a buddy who has a, a, a boat or a bird dog. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, you need to learn some plants or you need to make a friend who knows plants and you just yeah. take pictures of them and send it to the friend. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. So uh, that's why I invited you on here, John. To- yeah. Now- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Remember that? Uh, I, yeah. Now somebody heard that and they're like, "Oh, that turkey. He's he's that's when he when he wants to go fishing. That's why he's calling me up." Uh, no, I meant for plant identification. Uh, I didn't okay, even think about now. fishing. You're not going to take fishing with you, John. I, I'm not trying to go back. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> oh I'm kidding. no. I don't even think we've been fishing together. We should. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to uh, do that one day. Um, so, okay, we've got, let's, let's assume we've gotten rid of grass. Yeah. yeah. So the, the next, uh, I guess the next step, again, you've got to kind of diagnose everything, but in general, you've got to look at what does your landscape look like and what is my limiting factor? What am I trying to manage for? So if you're trying to manage for brood rearing cover, generally you're going to disturb that pretty frequently with either fire or disking. Disking works pretty well. Uh, for brood rearing cover and we tend to do that in the fall mainly because mm-hmm. if you disc in the spring you tend to get a less favorable plant response it's going to be mm-hmm. for those annual grasses things like crabgrass and johnson grass for anybody that's done moist soil management we actually want a disc in the spring and summer because we want those grasses right we're trying to make grass uh for for waterfowl food but mm-hmm. for bob whites and for turkeys we're trying to make more broadleaf plants and so we tend to disc do soil disturbance in the fall um okay now If you're talking about nesting cover, you're probably going to let it succeed a little bit longer, or you're probably going to look at breaking up fields or breaking up complexes of fields and doing different treatments at different times of year and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in that case, you might have part of the field that's a little bit older that you're leaving that way for nesting, whereas it'll be directly adjacent to the more recently disturbed area that would provide better brooding. Sure, so, sure. You got to just get your crayons out and kind of look at your property and lay it out how you want to how you want to break those fields up, or how do mm-hmm. you want to look at field complexes? Maybe you can have if you've got several fields that are close to one another that are already kind of broken up naturally. Maybe you can uh, incorporate those, or you can incorporate them into your existing forest management. We see we do that a lot on big tracts of public land. You know, we'll we're going to burn a stand. We'll take in the field. You know, and burn in. Uh, you know trying to burn it at different rotations but in general what we're trying to do is maintain you know what i'm sure your listeners are familiar with what we would call early successional cover and so mm-hmm. those are going to be those early serial stage plant communities um, that are usually going to be two to three years post disturbance now for wild turkeys um, you know you probably are looking at uh, a little bit longer for nesting cover for you know good nesting cover but that also mm-hmm. you know keep in mind that none of this is happening in a vacuum you may have nesting cover in the forest somewhere nearby right and that's the idea is to have some of of each that's and right what we were right. kind of we were kind of alluding to and maybe not saying directly is the thing that you and i both i think agree is most often missing is that high quality brooding cover that's right that's right so, so, yeah, and you can, like I said, we can get at that by a couple of different methods. And uh, usually what we see when we have properties that are using fire a lot, um, and, and if they are doing the brood, the field management for brood rearing and they're using a lot mm-hmm. of fire, they're mostly going to do that in the, in the dormant season. Uh, just, yeah. it's a common thing. Um, not, 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 you know, uh, trying to talk bad about anybody for doing dormant season burning, but that tends to be the most common fire regime. So what we mm-hmm. see is kind of a negative consequence of that is that tends to grass fields in or forests or whatever. If you're repeatedly burning on, let's say, a two to three year rotation and you're burning in February and March, it's going to be sage grass pretty quick. And mm-hmm. so when that so happens, let, go ahead. The, before you go on, when you're talking about grass now, you're talking about like native warm season grass. Yeah, native not grass. the same as the pasture grasses. So that's still, right. That's right. It's those, those fields, clump forming grasses, it, but you start to get. You know, they're a good thing, I guess, to have incorporated, but sure. not dominating. Is that what you're saying? That's right. That's right. It, it can, it won't take very long at all, really, for, for even the warm season grasses to become dominant. Um, 
mm-hmm. and it just depends again on the soil type and uh, your okay. where you are in the country. So, uh, yeah, I didn't want to cut you off, but maybe this can lead you back into where I think you were going. So, can you, if burning during that time it causes that issue what i'm gathering from that where you i think you were going is that by changing the timing of fire or changing what the disturbance is sure can uh can change that problem yeah 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 definitely so that's kind of you're right that's kind of where i was going essentially um if if you've got a field that's starting to grass in that's generally when we're going to go to the disking right you know disking is usually a, a good tool for making brood cover but when you start to have a field or even um, a forested area that's open enough and it starts to grass in that's when we really start to look for soil disturbance and I know you're the uh, you're the uh, uh, herbivory guy and and, uh, fire ecology fire and herbivory interactions and all I'm sure there's some natural (laughs) processes that tie in to all of that Mm -hmm. but I mean once we grass in a field, you, we've got to pretty much do some type of soil disturbance to try to break up that clump, that clump forming grass and be able to uh, stimulate some of those annual plants to come back in. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know. Interesting. So you're, when you're saying soil disturbance, you're talking about just disking? Uh, you know, in most of the South, um, the, the deep South, especially, we don't have the option to run livestock into an area in most cases mm-hmm. you know it's either livestock or it's recreation and so right. for the most part we're kind of left with disking and when mm-hmm. we talk about disking we're, there's a couple of different uh that not all discs are created equal not all uh sure. uh you know not all activities like that you know we, we've joked before when you get a dense patch of grass broom sedge field that's just socked in and you got a little small disc it's like dragging a dead chicken across it um it's mm-hmm. not going to break it up so sometimes you got to have <laughs> Uh, uh what we would call a new ground disc you know where i come from or an offset disc a cutting mm-hmm. disc if you will there's a bunch of different names for them but a big uh, basically a big heavy disc an aggressive disc to break mm-hmm. up uh grass where it's gotten to be really rank and dense um sure. then if you've got maybe you got sandy soil some people do that we're listening to you can get away with a less aggressive disc more of what we would mm-hmm. call a farm disc or your standard hunting club food plot disc you know what i mean mm-hmm um, there's, there's a bunch of different vendors and I think it, it, it's very difficult to describe as soon as I think I've described it, f- found a way to describe, uh, equipment. And I, I, l- I learned that I, I haven't done it very well, but in any yeah. case, uh, once you have that, you know, decided how heavy an implement you're going to be, a, you're going to need, or you've acquired one, let's say, then you got to worry about how intensively we're running that disc over there. So, you know, mm-hmm. you can't just do down and back sometimes what we would call a pass. If it's a heavy soil, sometimes it might take two or three passes down and back or even four mm-hmm. passes to break that grass up really well. But if you're yeah. in uh, some of that sandy coastal plain soil, you might get away with one pass, you know, down and back, mm-hmm. break the grass up and do a good job. It just it just depends on your soil type. Okay. So uh, what about the fire timing? Yeah, yeah, we hadn't talked about that much. So we, we do, uh, of course, I, I went straight to disking, but um, – we've tried a bunch of different things to decrease grass density with fire timing. And I don't know that we've got necessarily a definitive answer out. As soon as I say something, there are other fire people who are going to uh, send you hate mail and that's okay. Cause it's you, <laughs> I'm good with it, but yeah, essentially okay with them giving them to me. It, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> as long as they send it to you. Um, but I have not been able personally, nor have I seen a lot in the literature where we can, do us once we have a field that's already or, or a plant community that's already rank with grass we go in and implement summer fire or late summer fire any timing of fire that would decrease grass density i have not really seen that now i personally was involved we had a couple of summers where we had just red flag conditions bad droughts Mm-hmm. And we burned some areas that were socked in with grass fields now, not forest. You know, we weren't killing trees and whatnot. Burned them in July, you know, the heat of July. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you walk out in the field and it just crunches under your feet, crunch, crunch, crunch. You know, it's just terribly mm-hmm. dry. And when we got done burning, I thought, you know, I need to go to church. You know, we've 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 <laughs> we've committed a, a sin here. This is bad. I've I've killed everything in this field. Um, and and you come back the next growing season and it really does look like you've decreased grass presence mm-hmm. grass density 
But when you really look at it, what we did was decrease reproductive tillering. We just kind of made the bunches smaller. And mm-hmm. the next season you get a little rain and boom, it's right back to being just as thick as it was. So we didn't actually kill the grass or reduce the the plant population, if you will, of the grass. Maybe just make it a little stunted. So mm-hmm. I've kind of moved towards disking to decrease grass. But where fire timing does make a big difference is when we start to get woody vegetation coming into those fields. And I do feel like we can do a little bit, certainly in fields where we don't have the overstory trees to worry about, we can do a lot with fire timing and woody vegetation control. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can. So what in. would you? How would you change it to? Yeah, to be and, better with that. And without question, I would try to go in in the late growing season, and I would uh, I would try to get a severe fire. If I had a, a field that was just too dense with woody saplings, let's say we've got sweet gum or red maple or elm, something like that that's coming in, and I mean, you know. 500 stems of the acre. I mean, just a dense mm-hmm. sapling count. Uh, and it was in a field, man, there's, there's no reason not to go in with a, a late summer, August, September, maybe October fire and try mm-hmm. to get a severe fire. You know, you, so, you know, you and I, you can talk more about this than I, but basically, you know, I want, I want an intense fire. No, and, and I shouldn't, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't just want intense. I want severity. I want it to cause damage. So, mm-hmm. so uh, we're yeah, doing your, a, your intent is to kill all the trees. That's right. So. That's right. We're going to kill the trees. And uh, you can, you can actually in a field, it's just so much less stressful than it is trying to do that in a mature forest, you know, where you don't want to kill the big trees and you just want to. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that, that's kind of the happy thing about field management. And the thing that I enjoy the most about it is, not having to worry about killing the big trees because we can, we can get some really severe fires and, uh, and, when you and need take them. those woody things out. Yeah. That's something we haven't really talked about on here at all is the role that a se- more severe fire could play. We normally talk about, you know, low intensity meandering fires. No, this one's not a meandering fire. I want to, I want to yeah, make, a, a, I wanna make a scary fire uh, yeah. in, in the field. <laughs> And, uh, and again, you know, during that growing season, I want to get as much crown scorch as I can on that. I'm assuming we've get, we're talking about saplings that are, you know, six feet tall, six, seven feet and lower. When they get mm-hmm. much bigger than that, it's difficult because they start to make their own shade and you don't have fuel and it won't mm-hmm. carry and you won't get crown scorch. Everybody's familiar with that. So, um, yeah, no, we're talking about letting it roll, man. Yeah. Getting it done. Yeah. So uh well and another thing you you talked about repeatedly burning during the dormant season leading to a grass problem and and the late growing season not fixing that problem necessarily with with too much grass yeah Uh, but burning the fields in the the fall or the late growing season like you're talking about doesn't lead you to the grass problem either that one not necessarily um we there was actually you know Kaiser did a study there in Tennessee on it was planted native grass to be fair so the grass was already there but uh it actually you know it didn't it actually resulted in increased density with the with the late growing season fire i think i think what it comes down to is you got to mix up your pitches man you know mm-hmm. if you do the doing the same thing over and over again um that grass is just going to it's going to if you're just top, you know essentially burning the senescent material off the top of the grass over and over and over again, it's just going to keep responding. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but I, but I have heard people. So say, rotating disking in might might be a or, part of that in the long term, or mixing up your burn rotation. I mean, now all those kinds of things, you know, um, yeah. just kind of figuring figuring all that out. And, and it's not to say that having a dense grass plant community in some cases is a bad thing. I've got uh, some places where landowners are trying to manage, uh, you know, have a field here and there. Let's say that is a dense grass and it's a highly productive field and they burn it every two years. They want that hot, intense fire. You wouldn't want all your fields to look like that, but having one mm-hmm. or two uh, dense grass fields is, and their, their objective too is deer uh, cover, mm-hmm. you know, so that that's not, not to say that dense grass fields are just all, there's no place for them ever. Right. But when we're They're today's still episode, probably better than the, the uh, pasture grasses for most of the things that we were talking about. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. So <laughs> now we're talking about deer. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. Right now we're talking about turkey and and quail brood rearing. And right, so clearly right. we want to. Uh, now, the other thing I, I did want to mention, because we were just talking about killing woody vegetation. 
Mm-hmm. Woody vegetation is not altogether bad for brood rearing and nesting. If you look at most of the literature, especially for bob whites and especially for turkeys, some woody vegetation is okay. I mean, we don't, mm-hmm. you know, having this annual plant community, weedy plant community, certainly that's what we want for brood rearing cover, but having a few shrubs in there is not bad. And for nesting cover, it's certainly a good thing. You know, again, we're mm-hmm. providing uh, more vertical structure so that it can aid in predator avoidance and also having some uh, some thermal cover. Yeah, so having some little patches of, of uh, yeah. plums or, or uh, blackberry or something like that sure. scattered so, around isn't a bad thing. Yeah, not bad at all. So there's, I guess before we, before we wrap this up, there's something that just struck me. I haven't heard you say at all, and I always get asked about it, and I'm sure you do too. You, you haven't talked about planting anything to restore yeah. these, these old fields. So why, why have you not brought, brought up planting native uh, grass or forbs or whatever? Sure, just mainly because it's rarely necessary. Um, we do plant, bring plant material into a site on occasion when it is the landowner's goal to have a certain plant community. Sometimes we work with landowners that want to have an aesthetic. Maybe they mm-hmm. want to have a certain type of wildflower. Or they want it to be, you know what I mean? And that's, that's their, man, they pay the taxes, you know, that's, that's their right. And so we, we certainly will do that. I'm, I've, you know, we've gotten to be pretty good at planting, uh, native plant material, I'll be quite honest with you. But it's rarely necessary, almost almost never necessary for quality brood rearing and nesting cover. Okay. Almost so let's never. let's let's make that really clear. So if you have a field that you want the you know, the plants to be a certain community, sure. you would plant it in some cases to make sure that that happened. But in terms of making sure that it was good for tur- turkeys to bring their poults in you're telling me that that's almost never needed. Almost never. Plant. When I say almost never, I mean like if I've got a cotton field, I've we've literally walked away from cotton fields and never had to plant anything because yeah. even the mare's tail and stuff that comes in there the first year is going to be brood rearing cover. And so, by the so, second, third, and fourth year, you're starting to get some of those agronomic weeds out of there just through either mm-hmm. treating them or for regular old attrition, man. Even if you just – fallow fields you know by the third or fourth year some of those aggressive weeds kind of play out Mm -hmm. and uh, through the course of plant succession and and the seed bank response almost always we will get some type of usable plant material on the site without having to bring in outside Mm -hmm. plant material so in your so it sounds like you're saying almost just because you don't want to say never (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that you're correct. Well, no, I've I've legitimately had uh, times where you never did. We didn't, and you know, it really is not the cotton field example, Marcus. What happens is those pasture grass situations yeah. where we've come in and treated and treated and treated. I've and then we get woody vegetation. I've got it, it's just a soil type thing, really. I'll be honest with you. We get these really productive soil types, and we have to go in and just spray and spray and spray. Eventually, yeah. you'll run out. You, you know, you'll you'll run out of stuff. Yeah, you just you run out of stuff to colonize, and that yeah. that is desirable because you keep trying to get rid of all the stuff that's undesirable that keeps trying to get in there. Yeah, so, pretty much, pretty much. And then again, yeah. I have no problem if somebody has an aesthetic issue. They they like the way the native grass fields look that are planted and the wildflowers and stuff. Mm-hmm. And they want to do that by the house, man. I'll, I'd rather do that because I don't want you to be unhappy. You know, when you ride yeah. by it and and get mad at the way it looks. I don't like that weedy mess. Well, yeah. Fine. Let's plant it right there by the house. Let's, let's make it look good. Right. Yeah. We want, we want some high quality brooding cover around. That's what, what our goal is. So you need to be happy with it. So you want that's, to keep that around. Right. Well, you know, like I said, if it's five acres by the barn, man, let's do it. Let's plant it up, make it look pretty and yeah. look like a magazine cover, but you know, on the, everywhere else we're going to put, we're going to put good brewery cover for cheap. You know, yeah. we don't need to, you know, <laughs> we don't have to, we don't have to spend that money. The other yeah. thing too I didn't mention was herbicides, and uh, if you ever do have a woody problem that gets ahead of you, the the herbicides we have now are really good. Triclopyr, Arsenal, or, or Mazapyr is, is the chemical name. Um, spot applications work really well in fields because you can get to them. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? You can put the old the old gun on the on the back of the tractor and, and ride around and gun the the different trees. The boomless mm-hmm. nozzles now are really good. They're, they used to not be as good with calibration. Now they're really good. So herbicides are also a great tool uh, yeah. for getting the woody control and awesome. for treating those invasive plants. Yeah. 
All right. Well, I think you've pretty well covered that topic. Is there anything else that, that you think people that want, that are really interested in producing high quality brooding or nesting cover in their fields should know? No, man, I, I think that's it. I think you've just got to be active. You know, it's uh, like, I guess the, the two key things are um, it's an active management. So you got to mm-hmm. always be on top of it. You've got to be scouting that field and making sure you don't have invasive stuff coming in there, coat and grass and all those types of things. Um, again, an active management and be smart about it. Put it in those, those, uh, those lesser soil types. So you're not always fighting mm-hmm. um, vegetation growth. And then, uh, man, just have fun with it. Yeah, exactly. All right, John. Well, I really appreciate it. I knew uh, this would be a good conversation and and I always learn something from you. So I really appreciate you coming on here and telling everybody about this. Oh, yeah. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you. Uh, We'll talk to you next time. Fire University is part of the Natural Resource University podcast network funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you like what you heard today in this episode, please follow us on all the social media platforms at UF Deer Lab.